And as a result, uh, you don't see members of the church studying the Bible like they used to. Uh, we, at one time, were a Bible-knowing people. And everyone in basically around us knew that we would know the Bible. If there's a Bible question, they uh, ask a member of the church. They will know because we studied the Bible. The periods of our worship in which we studied, we didn't limit our Bible study to those times. We did it in additional to that. But we don't see, we don't see that generally in the church today uh, because of this disrespect that liberalism has caused within the Bible. And closely associated with that, there's no longer the bold proclamation of the truth. Um, there's men have, or preachers have, tried to water it down to such an extent that many times you don't even know what they're trying to say. And there's no bold proclamation and presentation of the truth that this is right and this is wrong. Instead of sermons being filled with the Bible, they are filled with just nice short stories and basically things that you could speak in any after-dinner speech. <clears throat> As a result of those things, along with many others, liberalism promotes worldliness in the church. And this is what we were talking about last time. And liberalism and worldliness really is a two-pronged sword. Worldliness brings liberalism to justify the worldliness. Liberalism justifies the worldliness, which promotes more worldliness. And so they go, off, they go together, and they actually feed off of each other. One promotes the other, and the other promotes the other. And so they go together. And as liberalism has increased within the church, we have seen within the church worldliness increasing. And last week we mentioned three things. Immodesty, uh, very simply a lot of people, both men and women, dress in a way that God would classify as being naked. Uh, and thus not modestly. Gambling, we mentioned that as the proliferation, especially in our society and in our states, of the lottery and chances and things along that line that are promoted even by our school systems. Uh, we've seen an increase in gambling. No one thinks anything about it anymore. And we mentioned lying last week because... No one considers lying all that bad anymore. Everyone does it. Uh, I think I heard one uh, statistic that uh, it was something like 95 or 97 percent of the people lie. That's in America. Well, that's a sad commentary on our society, even if it's not that many. It's still a sad commentary on our society, but that which has happened in society has made its way into the church as well. And so, telling a little story here or there, as it's put, which is nothing more than lying, it becomes all right as far as thinking is concerned. But the scriptures still teach that all liars, not just some, but all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. We have also seen the problem of immorality increasing even within the church. Sadly, even the aspect of homosexuality has increased to such an extent that now that there are some within the church 
who defend homosexuality. It's just another lifestyle because they've listened to the world and their arguments. And so, and some of them listening to the pseudoscientists that say, well, there's a homosexual gene. Well, no, there's not. Never has been, never will be. Homosexuality is a choice that one makes. Now, it might be, I realize when I say that, I'm not denying that there might be desires that one has, but you still don't have to act upon those desires. Uh, and that's the whole point. You make a choice to act upon the desires. Sometimes you have desires and you cannot act upon those desires. That's what self-control is all about. That's what being a Christian is. We have certain desires. All of us have desires that, w if acted upon, would be sinful. We don't act upon them. And homosexuals need to learn, you might have certain desires, but as long as you don't act upon it, that's the point that needs to be stressed. Do not act upon those desires. And then, you can be acceptable to God. But when you act upon the desires, then you commit sin. But some have justified the sin. Now then, that probably started long before that, though, to when fornication was, became accepted. That young people growing up, supposedly, the world told us, why, well, they're going to act upon their desires. Well, they shouldn't. They need to learn self-control. That's the point that we're making. But they're going to act upon their desires. And so, instead of teaching abstinence, our school started providing those things in order to try to prevent pregnancy. And we learned that it didn't work, and so... You know, back in 1970s, you had Roe v. Wade that comes up in which a woman takes a synonym or a, a fake name of Roe, Jane Roe, sued Wade, who was a prosecutor, because of an abortion that she supposedly had had, but found out that she didn't really. But in order to bring this case up, and finally the Supreme Court acted upon it with a ruling that said abortion is right. Well, no, it wasn't. But even some within the church then started, there's nothing wrong with abortion. As if their pronouncement would be making it right. Some even appealed to the Bible in order to try to, actually they perverted some things that were stated in the Old Testament to try and prove that, well, that fetus, that baby in the womb, wasn't really alive. And there's been our other arguments that have been taken through the years, but basically what abortion allowed was for fornication to take place, and then the, any consequences of that fornication can be done away with. And in society, you know, a, f a few years back, the abortion rate dropped a little bit. It has held steady for years and years at about one and a half million per year within the United States, and it dropped to about 1.2 million. And the abortionists got all upset. We aren't having enough abortions. But the problem was that thinking of to allow the fornication to take place, and you can just take care of any problem, it became a sin without any supposed consequence. And so, it starts making its way into the church, and yes, members of the church committing fornication. 
along with that became the teachings and numerous false doctrines about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Now, the Bible really is pretty clear upon the subject that if you put away your mate, except it be for fornication, and marry another, you commit adultery. But some come along and say, oh, it doesn't really mean that. It doesn't, it's not universal. It's only for those who are members of the church. That was James Bell's position, and not under bondage and such, that it was a teaching that was only for members of the church. Thus, someone who's outside of Christ, they can divorce and remarry and divorce and remarry hundreds of times if they wanted to. And when they became a Christian, though, they just had to stay with that one. And that became very popular among brethren. Even if a Christian should marry a non-Christian, it didn't apply to them. It only applied to Christians who were married to Christians. Someone jokingly said in relationship to that, well, just make sure you marry someone who's not a Christian, and then you don't have to worry about it if you get a divorce, and you can get as many divorces as you wish until you find that one and then convert her or convert him. But you start seeing the seeds of it's all right. It's acceptable to God. Even though God says they, shall, they continue to commit adultery. And so some wanted to change the meaning of the terms. Adultery is no longer a sexual term. Doesn't, doesn't do, have anything to do with sex. Now then... Most people don't know that unless they've studied under these um, post hole diggers. And then they can learn that adultery is not a sexual term. Well, what is it if it's not? Well, it only means covenant breaking. You simply broke the covenant that you had with your wife. And once you broke that covenant, then it doesn't matter what happens after that. Yet, there's all of these excuses to allow adulterers and fornicators in the Lord's church. James Woodruff, who was a teacher of mine at Harding University, or college at that time, came out with his book uh, in which he said that Paul just simply countermanded Christ. In other words, Christ, he took Christ's words and he said, they're no longer in effect. And listen to me. And the reason he did is because of the worldliness in the world and to allow it into the church. He started off his treatise with... He went out into the world and he kept meeting all of these individuals who had been married and divorced, married and divorced. And so he had to do something about it. And in one time in his pre presentation, he said you need to put rose-colored glasses on, basically. And you need to look at the Bible through these rose-colored glasses of grace and love. And those individuals, thus, that had been married and divorced, we have to do something in order to allow them to remain in their condition because they're not going to leave their mates. And so let's just bring them in the church anyway, even though God says they're committing adultery. But that was his solution to it. Just look at it through the aspect or through the glasses, those rose-colored glasses of love and grace, and just let, leave them in their sin. But these things were being taught through the years. And thus, now then we have reached a state in which 
those things are totally accepted not only in the world but now then in the church and elders what they end up doing especially in that area is a practice the don't ask don't tell type policy we don't want to know your marriage condition don't tell us that way we won't have to do anything about it. We won't have to make any decisions. And so they don't. They just accept someone, whatever situation they're in, that's fine. We'll accept them. But those practices, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, those types of immorality, they've slowly made their way into the Lord's church where so many places now they are accepted. Why? Because of, it's a worldliness problem, but it goes back to the liberalism that we see in the church. Because there is that disrespect of the, God's Word. Just as James Woodruff put it, that Paul was able to countermand what Christ said. And that's the word that he used, countermand. Why? Because there's a disrespect for the Bible. There's a disrespect for the words of the Bible. Another aspect of worldliness that has made its way into the Lord's church is that of beverage alcohol. At one point in time, I don't guess hardly anyone would have accepted beverage alcohol as far as a drinking type of a beverage. But now then, it is commonly accepted within the Lord's church. In one class that was being taught at one of our Christian universities, the teacher, after some of the students were discussing beverage alcohol and whether or not it was sin, and specifically John the second chapter, and Jesus turning water into wine, I put that in quotes, I'll mention that in a minute, he finally just made the, the statement, this is the teacher now, that Jesus made alcohol and everybody just might as well accept it. Now that's a teacher in one of our Christian colleges or universities. Well, no, he didn't. The word wine as used in the Bible is a generic term that embraces anything that is from the great... Uh, juice. It even refers in the Old Testament to the wine or the juice that's still in the grape and calls it wine. Yet it's still in the grape. There's no fermentation that's taken place whatsoever in that situation. Others have come along and they have said, well, during the Old Testament or the New Testament period, they didn't know any way to stop fermentation. <laughs> Again, they just didn't study this, what uh, the customs were of that day. They had numerous ways in which to prevent grape juice from fermenting. But yet it was called, that unfermented grape juice was called wine. It is a general term. Context determines whether it's an alcoholic wine or a non-alcoholic wine. Whether it's in the, still in the grape, that juice that's in the grape. Context determined the usage of the word wine. But understand, when you read the word wine, it does not necessarily mean alcoholic. But, if you listen to so many, even within the church today, anything that's, as long as you don't get drunk, it's all right. And that the only thing that is condemned is drunkenness. 
not even realizing that when you take one drink, you are to that extent drunk. You're one drink drunk when you take one drink. Or you could put it from another standpoint, the opposite standpoint. When you take one drink, you are one drink less sober than what you were before. God commands us to be sober-minded, soberness. But drinking is a major problem, as if drinking out beverage alcohol is all right, that it's not sinful. Why? Because worldliness has been coming into the church for all these number of years, and the liberalism that is seen within the church allows this to take place. Now, when we talk about beverage alcohol, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but many times 1 Timothy, the fifth chapter, is brought up. Why? Because Paul commands Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach's sake and his off infirmities. See you there? We can drink. That proves it. What was Paul commanding Timothy there? He was commanding him to take the proper medication that was needed for his stomach. That's the context in which that statement is given. Take a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. The wine in that case was medicine. And so we're not dealing with medicinal alcohol. Yes, there's alcohol that's found in cough syrups. There's wine that's found in other medications. We're not talking about those. We're talking about drinking alcohol as a beverage. And thus what some refer to mistakenly as social drinking. But they have brought that in. Why? Because of a disrespect for God's Word. God commands us to be sober. And when we drink beverage alcohol, we no longer are sober. Dancing is a problem within the church of our Lord as well. I had a long discussion with people who defended dancing. These are members of the Lord's church. Preachers sometimes. Defending the aspect of dancing, that it's all right. And yes, uh, there's been some in the past that teach dancing classes. These are members of the church. Hmm. As if it's all right. Well, I realize that dancing is mentioned in the Bible. And it's mentioned in an acceptable way many times. But you need to realize that it is never mentioned in an acceptable way when you have men and women dancing together. The only times in which dancing is mentioned in an acceptable way, it is only men doing it, or it's only women doing it. There's never a mixing of the sexes in relationship to dancing as far as an acceptable action in relationship to God. And generally, the aspect of dancing that is mentioned is not as what we would think of as dancing. It was just basically jumping up and down with joy or excitement. And thus, a dancing of jumping up and down. Well, I would probably say that most who want to dance today aren't simply just going to dance, jump up and down. And it's not going to be with those of the same sex. 
Why? Because there is a sexual aspect to dancing. A sexual appeal that is there. But they want to ignore those type of things. Why? Because liberalism has taken hold, and so they will bring in their worldliness and their sin and say that it's acceptable to God, when in reality it's not. And so liberalism and worldliness, they go hand in hand together. And liberalism will promote the worldliness in the church and has for many years, and that's why we see the church in such a sad state that we see today. The last point that I want to make in relationship to this lesson is that liberalism causes precious souls to be lost. There's the very basic point. That's the greatest problem with liberalism. We can talk about all of these things. Ultimately, it causes souls to be lost in hell. It carries an individual away from God's Word, which is able to save his soul, and thus be lost. John would write in 2 John verse 9, that whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, he hath, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. The doctrine of Christ is that teaching which originates from Christ. We could, it could have been tra properly translated, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in Christ's teaching. That would be a proper translation of, of the terms. Hath not God. Well, liberalism takes us away from Christ's teachings. And as a result, we hath not God. Liberalism causes us to go beyond that teaching of Christ. It causes us not to remain, to abide within that doctrine. And so we have not God. It separates us from fellowship with Him. And Paul would write in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through verse 9, that seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When it says he's going to, Take vengeance upon them that know not God. Well, there's one class of people. A second class is that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he says obey not, he uses a form of the word which means continuous action. He uses the present tense. And so one that does not continue to obey the gospel is going to be punished with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. That is, that individual who does not remain according to and being obedient to the gospel, he's going to be lost eternally in fire. There's the problem with liberalism because liberalism causes us not to continue to obey the gospel. It brings the world into our lives. It causes us to leave those moorings of God's word, that mooring of safety, so that we will be eternally lost. And as a result of liberalism, Many will not hear God's saving word. They just simply will never hear it. Liberalism destroys the evangelistic nature of the church. 
our marching orders as the church is save souls. Go preach to the lost. Edify the saved. Yes, that area of benevolence, benevolent work. But again, even that's for the saving of souls. Liberalism destroys that evangelistic nature back in the 1950s. The Church of Our Lord was the fastest growing religious body in America. Now then, we're not even a blimp on the radar. What happened? Liberalism happened. And liberalism destroyed the evangelistic nature of the church. You see, back then, it was every member of the church knowing the Bible, for one thing, talking to others about the Bible, and one-to-one personal contact is still the very best evangelistic way of teaching and converting people. You can get on the radio, on TV, and send out information, the very best way to convert someone is on a one-to-one basis. Talking to them, friends, neighbors, those people we come in contact with, talking to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. At that time we were doing it. Now then we're not. We've lost that evangelistic nature. And part of the reason is because of liberalism. And because liberalism has made us turn inward instead of turning outward. The church, by its very nature, is an outward-looking thing. Teaching others. Converting souls. Liberalism makes us turn inward to how can I satisfy myself? What can I do for us? And thus we come up with all of these programs and all of these organizations and all of these, this stuff instead of going out and preaching the gospel each and every member of the church. You see, liberalism has destroyed that evangelistic nature so that we no longer are growing and the church is declining in membership now. Without hearing God's word, man cannot be saved. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth is God's word, John 17 and verse 17. In Romans, the 10th chapter, Paul would say, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they call on him, or how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now when he says, how shall they hear without a preacher, he's not talking about someone like I am and who's up here, a public proclaimer of the truth. He's talking about, a member of the Lord's church who's going out and doing what he needs to do and preaching the gospel to the lost. You and me, all of us together. That's who he's talking about there. Now how can they believe on that individual whom they've not heard? How can they hear without one of us going and teaching the gospel to them? A preacher. That's the problem, though, with liberalism. It destroys that evangelistic nature of members of the Lord's church. Liberalism and the church. The church is a beautiful bride of Christ. Liberalism rapes the church. It destroys that pristine beauty of the church to where it is nothing but an ugly organization that's going to be separated from God. That's what liberalism does to the church and why we must fight against it 
with our entire being. If you're not a member of that beautiful bride of Christ, the church, and we would encourage you to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ, and in obeying that gospel, become a member of the church. If you haven't lived in the way that God wants you to live as a member of the church, and come back into Him and be restored, let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins. If we can help you along this line, then why not do so as we stand, come as we stand and sing the invitation song?